All right, this is a special edition of the Sports Rewatchables. Chris Ryan is here. Ryan Rosillo is here. We're going to talk about the town for about 20 minutes and then get into this. <laughs> no. <laughs> the two sweetest words in sports are game seven. It's tough to do a rewatchables when a game just happened, and yet this game feels like it happened five years ago. You and I watched this game together in my house, did a podcast after. Chris, you're a diehard Sixers fan. Yeah. You were doing After the Thrones mm -hmm. that night and couldn't watch it. And That's we're right. watching it on your phone? Yeah, I was just watching like the game cast. And for a while, I was like, sounds good. Looks like we're going to lose on the road on game seven. I'm, I accept that. And then it was tied with zero seconds left. And I was like, holy crap, we're going to go to overtime. I wonder if we can delay the Game of Thrones finale. And then it was still zero seconds and we lost. And I didn't understand what happened. And I looked briefly at our Slack and you would have thought like, you know, a tornado had hit the office. It was just an absolute pandemonium. Was this the Thrones finale? No, it was the, it was uh, like the second to last one, right? Oh. I think it was the, really? I think it was like the penultimate episode. I can't remember. It was what May, May 10th, night. right? Yeah. Maybe I shouldn't be on this one. Um, <laughs> I, really? I thought that was like the beginning because you were all excited about the numbers for the Watch the Thrones thing. No? Yeah. Well, I don't know. Either way, Chris hadn't watched the game until this, we made you watch this now. Yes. Yeah. So was it painful? Was it weird? Not what for the reasons the... that you would think, though. Okay. Like, I, first of all, I think that I have kind of have like a pretty healthy emotional re relationship with last season Sixers because I think it was always going to be a kind of temporary production, you know? Uh, in some way, shape, or form. And they were always a little bit ahead of schedule in terms of like where my mind was at with Simmons and Embiid and what the trajectory of that team that that team was supposed to be. And the Butler edition and the Harris edition was kind of like this last second sort of feel to it. So I was kind of fine with where they wound up, even though it was about where they wound up last season, the season before that. But it was th this game seven was more tough just from an entertainment standpoint than it was anything else. Yeah, I remember this game being way better than it actually was rewatching it. Because it's a bad the game. The defense yeah. was really good, but the offense was also really bad. And well, it was a tough combination. You know, uh, I think Reddick hit a three. That was the first points for them, and it was like seven minutes, yeah. seven minute mark of the first quarter. Yeah. And you know, who cares if it's six nothing? But the announcers, it was it was Harlan, it was Greg Anthony, and they're going, oh, you know, that's a huge three. Cut the lead in half. And you're like, no, no, they haven't scored in five minutes to start the game. Then they had another stretch that carried over from the end of the first to the second half where they didn't score for like five plus minutes. And then as you're watching it, you're going, how the hell did they even get to 90 points? Because yeah. they had so many just tough offensive possessions. And I think the counter to that for Toronto was that other than Ibaka, none of those guys did anything for Kawhi. Like Ibaka's kind of, I mean, look, Kawhi hit the shot. But Obaka is the reason why they ended up, you know, having another piece there. So yeah, it was a really ugly game. I didn't My remember. My memory it being of that bad. Raptors team was from kind of how it unfolded over those last two rounds, where Van Vliet and Lowry were actually mm -hmm. playing well, and all of a sudden they had these seven guys that could create a shot. That was not the case in in Game Seven, Round Two, and so it was just jarring to watch Fred Van Vliet like not have flame shooting out of his ass. No, 0 for 5, I think. <laughs> yeah. And he didn't, five. he didn't look comfortable at all. And didn't Siakam, play a ton, right? Like 19 minutes? For, no, no, they uh, couldn't play him because he couldn't shoot. And then Siakam, who, you know, everybody fell in love with this year, and I'm not, not but he was MIA in this game. Mm -hmm. We called him when we did the pod that night. It, the, these games are just different animals. I've been lucky enough to have been in the house for a bunch of these, and the intensity is different. It's slower. Every possession feels like a football game, life or death. And it's really interesting to see who rises up. And for Toronto, whatever reason, it was Obaka in this game. It's like but, watching Super Smash Brothers or something. Like the guys flying around on just like the most nor normal plays. And you see like, Jesus, did Lowry just go two rows into like the crowd on that? And it was yeah. just, it's just like an out of bounds play. It's, it's also, it's funny because we're in the, mo especially because what we do for a living, we're in this moment constantly of trying to figure out teams and narratives and, this and that, talking ourselves into things. But now that there's some distance with this Philly team, like when you were watching it, it's a pretty weird Philly team. It's exactly, no bench. This is I, my I, big picture thing. The, the, the five guys together didn't really ever make sense. But I think as the series went along, we were like, oh yeah, they could win the title. But now I look back, I'm like, man, that was a weird team. You look at this and it, we talk so much about front office stuff, roster moves. We're so infatuated with that. And I think part of that is because it's easier to talk about that than it is to spend two hours, two and a half hours watching a basketball game. But you can see every single decision and how much it matters in this game. Yes. You can see how 
how much potential the Sixers have, but how flawed they ultimately were in their construction. And kind of in a weird way, and we could talk about this because these are my two favorite players in the league, but you can see the Embiid Simmons stuff like in full display in this game and how complicated that setup is. The idea of having this generational center being a playmaker at the top of the key and having this point guard, I guess, being in the dunker spot and all the shooters around them not really having a place to stand, not really knowing where to be. And then on the flip side of that, just how elegantly composed this entire Toronto team was and just like everything fit. And so it's almost not a surprise now when you look back and like, yeah, that, that, that team kind of deserved to win the title. They were put together like a title team. And yet they, Philly almost won. I ended up disliking Philly even more after this game. Um, and you mean the actual 2018-19 team? Yeah, and you're right. Like we've talked about them in the moment of, wow, they're a bounce away from maybe winning this whole thing if they end up with Golden State and Durant goes down and you go, okay, tell you, I guess. Like, I can't tell you you're wrong if that's your argument. But, you know, the day-to-day, as, as you were talking about, being almost immersed in this every single day can can get in the way of, like, what a team looks like. And to have this, you know, this is the first basketball game I've watched start to finish in months, you know, that would be something like this. And I'm watching it going... This Philly offense is just, it's the same thing. Like, all the things you think you know about a team are confirmed again in this. Yeah. And whether it's the late possessions, you know, Simmons not ever figuring out how to how to fit on the floor. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Where he to just stand fought. during possessions. He, like he, he doesn't, yeah, it's nuts. And then, like, if Embiid finally feels like he has space, then Simmons will, like, crash the baseline to be, like, underneath. <laughs> yeah. And you go, what are you, why are you bringing your guy over here? And so I don't know... If Simmons had said to the team, like, hey, I fell out of love with basketball, and now he's back, so that's great news. <laughs> but <laughs> Did he say that? Yeah, he yeah, just said recently that he yeah. fell back in love with basketball. I'd be like, dude, you've been in the league. He's 22, right. 23. What the hell is that? That's like a teenage kid telling he has a midlife crisis. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, I was shocked. First of all, no bench whatsoever. I think I have it written down here somewhere. The bench was uh, minus 29 and played a total of 29 minutes. Yeah, it's like Ennis Scott. Did Monroe play for a Monroe, minute? Yeah, Greg Monroe minutes. got in there. It yeah. wasn't in the YouTube clips we had, but Monroe had a two-minute minus nine. And <laughs> His <laughs> offensive rating was zero. So they were basically stuck with these five guys, but five guys that didn't really make sense together. Like, I remember when Philly got Harris and all the, uh, the nerds were smartly saying, like, this is somebody that thrives on pick and roll. Sure. If he has the ball and you set him a pick, he makes really good decisions. His All these stats happen. And then you watch how they used him in this game, and he's either standing in the corner or he's at the top, like trying to beat guys off the dribble. That was weird. Hey, I, I, I came away like being even more unimpressed with Brett Brown. I hate bl- doing the blame the coach thing, but they just never figured out what to do with those five guys together. And you could feel it, like the shot clock violations. This is This is it, man. If they get by... Yeah, we're going to talk about whether they could have beaten Milwaukee, but this is as close as anybody came to beating Toronto. Yeah, but maybe it comes down to just a, ma- a matter of talent. You know, I mean, like when you talk, because we, we, we're probably underplaying what Kawhi did in this game on one leg. But don't you feel like Philly had more talent? I thought it was overwhelming Philly had more talent, like in the fourth quarter at I least. think the, like the absolute optimal version of the talent that Philly had is better than Toronto's. But True. when you even look at Toronto, who did not exactly run like a lot of exotic stuff, Offensively, no. Kawhi was just stupid in this game. Yeah, for a couple but they were spread but... out in the right way. Like those guys sick. were standing in the right places. They True. knew when to crash the boards and when to stay out of his way. And Philly, it's all like, oh crap, this guy's like three feet from me. And then nobody, what nobody crashed the weak side. It's just like it doesn't make any sense. Kawhi missed twenty three shots in this game, and I thought he was spectacular. He because he was though. Like and, and I, I remember looking at the box score and we were like, he took that many shots. But this this was such a. Hey, I'm the best player in the league now. You know, I just am. And whoever you want to put ahead of me, fine. And I know it's not going to look as flashy as some of those other guys. I'm still convinced that his shoulder shape is is like one of the biggest reasons he's such an effective basketball player because he can keep you further away from him because your shoulders are wider than yeah. like the average guy. Like there, there's, there's stuff going on with his body that just makes it easier for him. And, you know, whether it was him seeing a double, then waiting for the double to retreat, then attacking, or him pulling up. Uh, he, had a, he had a switch where Embiid got stuck on him and Embiid gave him a great contest and he just stuck it right in his face. And you're like, this guy is just doing this. And you're right, the spacing was really good, mm-hmm. but there were never any possessions where Kawhi I could kind of like sit back and go, let me, 
let me see, like the Abaca three was off of something else. Gasol had a three that was kind of a weird possession. But you're right, Lowry wasn't scoring, Siakam wasn't scoring, and Kawhi had to do it all on his own. And Philly, you know, in their normal way, it, it felt like they were just having guys take turns. It made me realize how dumb it would have been if Kawhi had gone to the Lakers. Because he's so good as a creator in this game, and people are just missing shots. You know, Toronto could, could have had 20, 25 more points in this game. They end up getting a lot of offensive rebounds and stuff. But the decisions he's making, and they're basically double teaming him. Any chance they can, they're sending Embiid out at him or sending a second player. Embiid's always waiting for him. But he they're always knew, really like, worried. He, it was great, though, because he always kind of knew, like, oh, okay, here it comes, and right. watch this. I'm going to, like, yeah. one like time. watching a quarterback. One time they sent a double at him, and he was almost like, all right, come on. And then he just, like, went right by him, and he timed it perfectly to go, you you think you're just giving me, like, a show here, and I'm waiting for you to, like, be out of position, and I'm just going to go around you. So, Once I you, don't know, putting that on the Lakers, where basically that's LeBron's job, and LeBron's the best probably ever at it at the forward position of deciding, other than him and Bird, other how am I going to use my four teammates on every play? I don't, I wouldn't have wanted to see Kawhi relegated to, like, all right, you're going to be over there. Because I, I think he's better than that. And you could argue that at this point in his career, he might be better than LeBron at doing that stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think he also, clearly after watching him on Toronto, he needs to be the focal point of a team. That's he's, what I mean. Yeah, he's yeah. not like an additional piece. He has to, you actually have to run everything through him, which makes George like a really good So compliment. how would that have worked with the Lakers? I, I don't know how I'm they would have done that. I'm not arguing that I wish he was a Laker. Yeah. But it almost happened. Yeah. If, the, if OKC is like, fuck you, we're not trading Paul George. I think he goes to the Lakers. Oh, you don't, you don't think it's either Clippers or staying staying in Toronto for another two years? Or I don't think he's going to the Clippers without a second guy. I mean, they, all the articles that have been re written since then were basically him saying, "I want to come here, but you have to get another guy," and that's what led to the Paul George thing. What they didn't know was Paul George was already kind of figuring out his exit plan. Now he ends up getting a second guy. He's had two surgeries, who's not even going to be there for the start of the season. as a metal rod in his leg, but. You know, the upside of it, I guess, is that <laughs> yeah, well, when you put it that way. Well, I mean, he's, I, I do worry about it's not this. Like he's Tom Sizemore. I mean, he's got like, Paul George is pretty good. I'm sure he'll be fine after a couple of surgeries. I hope so. Yeah. Paul George is incredible at the beginning of this year. Yeah. I mean, he went from like the, I remember that first week, like I sent out a Paul George tweet where I'm like, I don't know, man. And then he like was an MVP caliber player for the next two or three months. But I've seen him enough in playoff games. I don't know. I mean, what Kawhi did in the game seven, mm -hmm. like Paul George has never shown me something like that. So watching this game, did you feel like you kind of wish the Sixers had kept this group together or are you glad that they've gone in a completely different This direction? is a tough Jimmy Butler game. It's a, it, but it's like a very, it's a very like clarifying Jimmy Butler game because in my mind, watching it back, you're kind of like, I think what he's doing is is like, I'm going to try and score like four or six a quarter and then take over in the fourth. I mean, he comes out of the fourth quarter gate just like, I, it's, I'm, I got this. And it works for about two or three minutes. But I don't think that he is able to play like within the flow of a game like that with a team like this. So I'm kind of okay with the team breaking up. I have no idea what they'll be this season. I'm excited to find out. But I, I'm not... How about JJ? Um... I think the negatives with JJ, it, I, I think JJ, man, that's, that's tough. It wasn't as bad in this game, but there were other games in this series where it was really tough defensively. Yeah. And I think it was tough defensively the last two years. It's hard to have a wing player who's just one way like that. The one thing with him though is he will take the biggest shot of the game on the road in a playoff game like this, you know? And even if you look at the end when uh, it ends up being the play before Butler makes the layup to cut it to tie the game with four seconds left, but JJ's lurking around. Mm -hmm. Like, he wants it. Like, he's ready. He has the most confidence out of anybody. J Butler played this game like he thought the shot clock was like the college shot clock. <laughs> <laughs> like, he had 30 seconds. He's milking it down to four or five seconds and then like, oh shit, I guess I gotta make a play. I uh, Can I just jump in on the Butler thing, though? Because yeah. that fourth quarter, I think that was Butler being like, all right, we can keep running this this messed up stuff or this I can just try to Embiid take over a little bit. with the ball at the top of the key right. stuff. And the Embiid at the top of the key thing was was a real problem here in this game. And it, was a, it wasn't a great Embiid game. So I think Butler, through the course of this entire Philly run, it's now over, but I always felt like he had these moments where he just was sick of those dudes and was like, I'm just going to go ahead and do my own thing. So I, I didn't end up, when I was re-watching it today, I didn't end up, 
feeling negative about Jimmy Butler at all. In a weird way, I was like, you know what? I, I kind of get where he's at, even though those two possessions in the far right corner, like the one shot clock where he throws it to yeah. Embiid, like it's a pass. And Embiid's like, what are you doing? <laughs> and then he had another one. I mean, they were bad, but then it's like, oh, no way. Philly's having these bad possessions late in a close game. Like I just got pretty used. I'm sure you can speak to that, Chris, how many times it felt like, you know, I don't know what their fourth quarter efficiency is. I know there's probably a counter to what I'm saying, but just they need to figure out a way to make this easier. And I don't know if Brett's that guy. And, and Brett Brown, think about that. When that game was over, everyone's like, oh, he's, he's done. He's done. And it wasn't just like you or I on a podcast. No, was, I mean, the owner had done like a, he had given like a weird press conference yeah. where he was Guys like. Guys around the league were pretty like, Pretty sure yeah. he's coming back or yeah. whatever. Yeah. And then it's like, no, no, oh, good to go. And I don't know if that's just the contract Well, that had been the what, talk but, before, the year before, after when they lost to Boston, I think, right, in the in 2018, it was that he was going to go and then Colangelo happened. Yeah. Right after that. It's a good example of if you treat everybody around you greatly and he has a lot of media friends and he's he's played the game correctly, that there actually was like a, a backlash to the Brett Browns definitely getting fired within a day of this game. People were like, wow, he deserves another chance. Can't hang this on Brett. I think that I there's know. a lot the of goodwill years, towards Brett just as much as about the media stuff that it has to do with like he steadied the ship throughout a pretty rough patch for this franchise. So why not let him have the good guys? But like, did why you does feel he have like to, did you feel like the last two years? Yeah, he's had the good guys. You had the for right two years. coach. Cause the way watching Embiid and how he was used in this game was one of the things that really jumped out at me. He was six for eighteen. Wasn't really posting up. At how many all. times did he start at the top? With it that was constant. awful, like fake three point ball yeah, fake. That, when, if you're Toronto, Gasol you're like, shoot that. jumping on. He stopped biting on that. It, it stopped working entirely. Yeah, and there was, was a bunch of like thing was charger block calls in the in the sort of the second half of the game that was just because every time Embiid would pump, Gasol would be like, "Okay, I'm between the two of you on Jimmy Butler." I agree with your point. He was who I thought he was in this game. And I agree with your point. He's he's weirdly disappointing, but I actually think this is who he is. He's, you know, he's a second level guy, and that's why like with Miami paying all that money for him. If he's your if he's your number one guy, I yeah, you can win forty five games, but in a game like this, he can't. You need somebody who's going to walk out of the saloon and battle Kawhi. And he's it's, not it's that funny guy. today. Like Spolstra was talking, and he said Butler is definitely a top fifteen guy, which I thought was an interesting number to put on it. Right. You're not saying top eight. He's the next tier. Yeah. And you gave up Josh Richardson and what you gave up for it. So is is that enough? Is that is top 15 enough for what you're giving it's up? It's kind of like a Matt Ryan. <laughs> uh, you know, like one of those QBs that he's not the Rodgers, Brady kind of level, Mahomes. But that next level, but if you put all the right pieces around him, you might be able to win a Super Bowl. But he's not going to carry you to the Super Bowl. No, I always feel like the Matt Ryan arguments are people arguing well, they all agree. <laughs> you know, so you're like, wait a minute, no way, you know? And they're like, well, wait, wait, are you, like, where do you have them? Like, yeah. oh, nine, twelve. Yeah, who's I'm more? Like, is it like more like Rivers? Yeah, I'd be like, that's cool. That's yeah, what I maybe have too. Rivers is a good one. It feels like everything has to run through him. Like your team has to be the Philip Rivers style if you're gonna have him. We didn't. We didn't. We should. I probably should have led with this, but we didn't talk before we get to the categories and stuff about the significance of this Kawhi game, big picture. Mm -hmm course of basketball history type of thing. It put him on a map in a, in a completely different way. And I think the free agency did as well, where this was a guy who was the best player in the 2014 finals, probably, but we didn't think he was the best player. He was the best player in that series. We knew in 2017, this is a top five guy, but you still kind of need that. You need that one great movie. You need the one great TV show. You need the one great playoff run to go up a notch. And, you know, we talked about it ad nauseum last spring. Like, oh my God, this is this is crazy. He's the best player in the league. And then these lists start coming out a couple of weeks ago. SI does their list, top, top players and ESPN. Kawhi's not the top player in the league on these lists. And it's like, what else did this dude have to do? This guy's the best player in the league. What I thought we left the playoffs all thinking this. <laughs> I don't understand what's changed. Doesn't he have, he has the championship belt right now, is my point. Right. And think about the drop off between him and the second best player on Toronto. Well, some roster. people would say like Giannis, but it's like Kawhi just did it. Mm -hmm. we, yeah. we, you're putting Giannis one because he won the MVP last year and you think he might be able to do it. But as we saw in the playoffs, 
you know, Kawhi is just at another level of of kind of consistency and knowledge and know-how, and he's been in all these different situations. I think Giannis can get there, but I think Kawhi is clearly the number one guy. I just think I, it means but we, I don't think that's a consensus pick right now. It's actually, I wonder if he's almost underrated because there's so little theater to what he does. There's so little narrative behind his performances in the way that there are for Steph, even in the way there are for Giannis, even in the way there is for Harden or when he was healthy, Durant. It's just like, it's almost like just pure. It's just pure like he's better than everybody, but there's just nothing else around it. There's no other story around it. I think the fact that the Warriors... He won't comment on things. He doesn't build things up. He doesn't talk about like a chip on his shoulder or what he needs out of this or what he wants out of this. It's it. It's not even the commercials. There is actually like an active lack of participation in what people who write about basketball need to be like, and this is where LeBron is at. This is his season. This season means this. Kawhi doesn't participate in any of that. The worst thing hurt him too from this argument specifically because Durant goes down and Clay goes down and then that became as much of a storyline as the Raptors winning. So it was like Kawhi beat the Warriors, but not totally Mm because this guy was hurt and that guy was hurt. I still feel like we came out of the playoffs. He was the best guy in the league. Whenever I look at those lists though, and I know because the ESPN one, like I voted in it, it's really heavy analytics if you look at the panel of people. So I don't know, you know, straight up right now what the projections are for Giannis versus somebody else, but I'm assuming that has a lot to do with it. Yeah. Where it's like, oh, okay, well, Giannis is this. Like, I'll look through some of those lists and be like, you're just dogging this guy who has who brings way more to the table, but you're just you're throwing him in the 20s because you don't think he's as efficient as this tall guy who you have at eight. Like, so whenever I look at those lists, I don't I don't know how you could do what Kawhi just did. You know, he didn't have Durant or Steph as a teammate. He didn't He didn't have Dwayne Wade. He didn't have these dudes. And he didn't totally seem healthy by the last two rounds either. He didn't well, seem if he's healthy. Not healthy. He's like 80, 85%, it seemed I like. I hear that, like, when you said he has on one leg, like, I don't know, was he, does he look that not healthy to you? I just didn't I feel like there was, was the any next lift. two rounds that got worse. Yeah, yeah, but even in this game, I mean, this game also, like, everybody looked, the, like half the Sixers looked dead in the first quarter, at least. Like there just seemed to be a lot. And it wasn't even like Toronto flu. I think it was just guys who were like dragging a little bit. But this was not like a like a showcase for athleticism. And Kawhi, a lot of his stuff was like drawing contact and then getting so, getting a shot off somehow. I think one of the cool things about this game and just how I'm going to remember the Kawhi run was this happens sometimes in basketball. And this is why I hate, I hate the let's completely rely on the stats part of this. 16 for 39 in this game, right? 41% shooting. It's not like spectacular. But if you actually like watch the game carefully and you really know basketball and understand the ebbs and flows and you can compare this to different seasons and stuff, this doesn't happen often when somebody goes, my team doesn't have it. I'm going to have to basically do everything here. It's not going to turn out that great because they have a seven foot three guy guarding the rim <laughs> and multiple people to switch on me. Yeah, um, I'm going to pick my spots. He take the first three quarters. I think he took 30 of their 70 shots. Then you look down we the stretch. The, he's doing everything. We were looking at the box score at your house, laughing out loud. We were like, "Do you know how many shots he's and taking?" It didn't feel, it, but it wasn't <laughs> selfish. It was that's like why if he doesn't do this, right. they're going to lose. That's why. But when you looked at the number, though, you would go, "Oh." Like that's nuts. Yeah, it but really it did, doesn't. It, it doesn't become apparent until like the late second half, when you're like, "Wait a second. Yeah, he's taking every shot. He's doing all these different things. And he was and yet- defensively, he's all over the place. The best version of this game was Jordan in uh, Game Six in Utah, in 1998. The famous makes the shot at the end. And if you look at the way the pace of that game, Rodman's basically out of the league at that point. He's out there, but he's 50 percent of who he was. Pippen's back is so bad he can barely move. Everybody else is glorified role player. And Jordan just assesses this game, and he's like, all right, I'm going to have to score half of our points. It's going to have to have a really slow pace. I'm going to have to pick my spots. I'm not going to really be able to rest, but I'm going to control this game, and here's here's the plan. I'm going to calculate it this way. And it does feel like that's what Kawhi did. I don't know if that was necessarily his plan heading into the game, but mm-hmm. I think he kind of assessed it. You see, like, Siakam's terrified. He doesn't want to shoot. And he shoots, he air balls a three by seven feet. Lowry couldn't make a shot. Van Vliet couldn't make a shot. And he kind of looks around. He's like, all right, I guess this is how it has to go, which is one of the reasons I love basketball. Like, Iverson was like this in 2001. Yeah. Who else was scoring on that team? No, it's like Keith Van Horn. I can't remember. Yeah. Before the Matumbo trade. It's like, it was, yeah. like Eric's with the Eric Snow ISO. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have to shoot 30 times for us to compete. The stats aren't going to be great, but I, it doesn't happen that often, but it was pretty cool. But back to Ryan's point, 
it, the the guy who jumps out after Kawhi in this game is Ibaka, and you're just like, I can't believe if he misses three of these shots, like this. Well, a couple the, of those offensive rebounds yeah, he got. Yeah, they had that one possession where they had two offensive boards and it led to an Ibaka three and it was like such a killer Yeah, because you were like, oh, you know, it's tough for us to get any buckets. But, you know, the, the Ibaka thing's always been kind of funny because I think we loved him when he was in OKC about like what he could be. And then he and, weirdly became a little overrated. People like know, loved totally. him too much. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. And then you're like, he's really just a tall two guard now. Like, yeah. I don't know what his deal is. And then Orlando's like, all right, we're moving on. And then he really did have this resurgence and Ibaka allowed especially in the Golden State series, if they wanted to go smaller, Abaka killed Golden State in, um, well, I think it was the clinching game that I was, I was there he for. He had a couple good Golden yeah. State games, yeah. And so, you know, this was really a, I don't know if it's redemption or whatever for Abaka, but Abaka, you're right. I mean, I, I thought there were some stretches. Where I'm like, do people know what you're getting when you really get Abaka? And this was, this was huge for him because, you know, Siakam didn't even want to do anything at the end, which which scared me a little bit. Cause you're like, here's this amazing story, this improvement. And you're like, eh, I'm good. Like I'm good. And I that, have to that's imagine a little tough, though, when you're young that's, and you yeah, haven't played totally, a game right. like this. The game seven jitters though. Like I was Oof. looking through, uh, like Kyle Newbeck had a piece that was just all like the sort of history of Sixers and game sevens on Philly voice. And it was like all Can this stuff. Can you send me that? Yeah. <laughs> um, and it was, you were looking at the records of all the players on the Sixers going into game sevens. And it was all just like, oh, and one. These guys don't get chances to play game sevens that often. You know what I mean? Like the, And so it was like seeing Siakam out there, it was like, yeah, he does some like cool, useful things. And he's really great when it's a little bit more of a flat track. But you can just see how when everything tightens up like that, he just wasn't ready. Well, you also had two teams that had pretty much figured it out each other by the seventh game of the series. Yeah. Where it's like, oh, I know what you're doing. You know what we're doing. I've been to a few good game sevens in my life. I went to 81 Sixers Celtics Game 7, which is the greatest basketball game I've ever been to. 84 Celtics Lakers Game 7. Um, a couple in the 87 Pistons Celtics and then Bucks Celtics. I don't know, I've probably been to like maybe seven or eight. And they all feel the same. There's so much energy in the building. Nobody plays well. It's almost like you kind of have to survive it and not screw the game up, but nobody's going to be like, I was fucking awesome in that game seven, man. I was hitting everything. Cause it's just, the intensity is different and the defense is at another level. And you could see it in this, like this is the best defensive game Philly had to have played with those five guys. I would guess yeah, they're it, all over the place. I don't want to like game. go full Trey Wingo, but like you can't appreciate the defense here. Like oh, it man. is like there's guys coming off of picks and then there's just like three dudes waiting for and them. And was all yeah. really left everything out. On the floor, I felt like defensively, offensively, I had some issues. But even Simmons, I thought they played good defense on that. He did actually got an okay job on yeah. Kawhi. <laughs> Kawhi made nine shots in the second half. And really, none of them were easy, except he got a wide open three off of like a second offensive rebound. But all of them were runners with two guys on him. Um, Pull-up jumpers where he's shooting over Embiid coming out at him. Hit three pointers with a hand in his face. Like these were not easy baskets. No, the the MB jumper one was. Or I had to we'll go back and rewind it. I'm like, right. are you serious? Yeah. Like you stepped into Embiid. Embiid's full on contest with his hand and up. His yeah. hand up. That's what I mean. And it's like, nah, I'll just stick it. Although, I still would love to know what the hell Simmons was doing <laughs> defensively oh, on the Kawhi we game. We got to save that because right. we're getting to that. So, a couple weird statistical things about this game. Philly shoots 64 shots. And Toronto takes 89. Toronto had 25 more shots in this game. Philly had 30 free throws. Toronto had 19. The two of them combined 16 for 57 from three, which is usually how it goes in a game like this. You know, you think like games, I didn't go to this one. Game seven, Warriors, Cavs, 2016. You go back and watch that. You remember the LeBron block, block Kyrie makes the three. That last six minutes is atrocious. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's just bad possessions. It's a lot like this. 24 second violations, people heaving the ball up with a second left because the defense just becomes frenetic. Right. And at some point, defense is better than offense. It reminds me of like, uh, Steve Kerr was talking about the Durant thing when Durant had that comment about, you know, that offense was just too constrictive, the motion. Oh yeah. Sometimes a chef's got to cook, whatever <laughs> yeah. the fuck he said. And Steve Kerr was like, he's right. We have the motion offense, but what made that 2017 team great was that as the playoffs go on, you need somebody who can create a shot. And he was the best in the league at that, and that's why our team was so great. And the same thing in this game. At some point, the defense is going to make pretty much everything impossible. And then it comes down to, like, who can create a shot? Yeah. 
Kawhi could create a shot better than anybody on Philly, and they win by three. The other thing that jumped out, and you know, this could be a little bit more Philly, but like sometimes when I'm sitting there trying to identify, like, are you running a set? Or are you running a set? There's almost nothing. On like, Philly's side. I'm I'm sure a scout could say, hey, this is where they started and this was the first action. And so this technically is something. But watching it again this morning, I'm like, this is why you pay it's those just guys. Little screens at the yeah. top mm-hmm. for it. The, I mean, the pick that's and, what everybody does. But, I, but just, that was it. That was their offense. But that's why you pay these guys. That's why teams are still maxing out Jimmy Butler. Because even if we were like, okay, shit, we can't get one of those 15 guys or he's not a mm-hmm. top 10. Okay, though. And that's why, you know, whenever I look at teams now, I just basically think how many guys do they have that can get buckets on their own? And Philly losing this series is, I know it sounds crazy because Toronto just won this little thing, but but I'd be more pissed. Like, I was more, I don't care, but if I were a Philly fan, I'd watch that game again today. And feel going, like you, going, it was like, a missed how, opportunity. How, like, you got nothing out of Siakam, Abaka hit some threes, and then the rest of these dudes collectively couldn't beat them? Yeah. It's tough. Well, Toronto had 16 offensive rebounds. Philly had five. And I do think home court advantage mattered in this game from an energy standpoint. There's no question. The crowd's so into it. There's no question. It but affects it. You know what was weird is, is they were down. Philly was down 50-41. And you're like, okay. This is it. This is over. And then Philly goes on what? A 14 nothing run or something ridiculous? Yeah, let's go backwards. So... It's 18-13 after one quarter. It's just a rock fight. <laughs> right. I mean, it was so, rock fight. I, I'm like watching it this morning in my house going, we're doing this game. It's bad. 44-40 at halftime. Some good Ben Simmons stuff in the second quarter. And it was a recurring thing with this Philly team where the way they used Ben earlier in the game versus as the game got tighter at the end when he just became Ben Wallace in 2006, kind of setting picks and mm-hmm. getting offensive rebounds. But there was some creativeness with how they were using him. I was like, okay, this will maybe this will be a good Ben Simmons game. And then it turned out it wasn't. Uh, Toronto's up 50 41. Philly goes on a 16 to nothing run. And at that point, this is when Greg Anthony says, uh, six minutes left in the third quarter. Greg, Greg Anthony was actually weirdly good in this game, but he said, uh, Kawhi is sensing that nobody else wants to step up. That's why he's being so aggressive. Hmm. It's rare for an announcer to just say that, but that was the vibe. Philly was running away with the game and nobody in Toronto yeah, was playing. Yeah, Lowry well. wasn't shooting, yeah. And then uh, Abaka ends up having a big energy run. Toronto flips it. Kawhi makes that three you mentioned off of two offensive rebounds. A little back and forth. 67-64 after three quarters. Big Abaka quarter. That's when Kawhi had taken 30 of the 70 shots. Abaka makes a crazy contested three with a hand in his face, like off balance with his legs kicking out like Reggie Miller. Toronto goes up five, and then it ends up, Toronto's up two, six minutes left, and that's when it becomes really, really ugly. Philly, it was 85-85, about- and Philly had two horrible back-to-back positions. Yeah, so Reddick like, makes a okay. three-point play, tie game, 85-85, 24-second violation, Kawhi bricks a tough three, Butler air ball three at the end of the shot <laughs> yeah, clock. Yeah, that was like another shot yeah. clock. I think they had what what technically, they weren't officially, but it was like three shot clock violations in a row, even though like one Butler wasn't. Butler heaved a yeah, yeah, right. right. So Kawhi makes a long two off a dribble handoff. Now they're up to a minute 40 left. Another terrible Philly possession, ste- the steal with like a second left on the shot clock. And Siaka makes that crazy driving layup. Yeah. They go up four. Now you think, oh, Toronto's got this. They have it. Um, free throw for Philly. Kawhi gets a miss. Abaka rebounds it. Kawhi misses a tough three. Now Philly has the ball. I had forgotten this part. Embiid gets fouled two free throws. They're down one. Kawhi gets fouled. One and, of two for Kawhi. Yeah, he misses. Yeah. yeah. This shades is a of, real, that's a real sliding door. Shades of game six, uh, 2013, when yeah. he missed the one of two against uh, Miami. And then coming off that missed free throw, Butler makes his best play of the game. Mm-hmm. He just goes full steam down, driving layup, tie game. 90, 94.2 seconds left. And then... It happens. Let's just get to the categories so we can talk about some good stuff. Uh, most rewatchable sequence is just, I mean, clearly the end. And what's cool about that shot is in the Twitter YouTube era, as we've perfected the reaction stuff over the course of the decade, you go on YouTube, there's just reactions galore from yeah. the people outside in Toronto, people in bars. Toronto fans in bars. At home with their kids, and there's it's just loaded with Greg YouTube Popovich stuff. alone in his rec room, <laughs> just throwing darts at something. Uh, but that shot, 
is the all-time non-finals holy shit shot I think that anybody's made. Would be my take. And that it took a little extra time to go was, down. The, it, the drama of that. Of oh, like, my wait God. Minute, and then, you know, the first thing I look for, I go, oh, is there somebody? Because I don't like that we do this, but it's like, all right, is there somebody to blame on this inbound? They play it well. Mm -hmm. They get him beat. I mean, again, Simmons, I have no clue what he's doing on that inbound. He it's, said, it's really bad. He stops bad. at the tail end. Instead, he yeah. basically could just follow him. I think he was afraid of running into him, Bead. Like Maybe would, I don't know. It's weird because he just he doesn't he doesn't stop in the play to do something else. He right. just stops. It's not like he gets distracted by but, some guy flashing. You know, as I as I start going down that road, and then I always have to get back on the track of like the shot was ridiculous, dude. It was ridiculous, ridiculous. Have, made, I, have, so. I don't think I've ever seen a guy with that little amount of time on the clock get the ball inbounds and and not. Like, and basically be like, that's where I want to be is over there on the other side. Like, it just seemed like he had an, a zone he needed to get to. He talked about this after the game where he's like, I, I practiced that shot. That's a shot. That's a spot I love. And I was like, you, so you fucking went all the way to the other side of the court with four seconds left? Well, you forgot that there was a seven foot three person chasing him mm -hmm. who almost blocked it. Right. I mean, that's. That part is like that, that the Embiid factor of that shot <laughs> pushes it over the top. It's. I would say it's like an A plus degree of difficulty shot. I don't think there's a harder shot to take than that shot. You're you're falling away, you're full speed, you have Simmons right next to you ready to poke the ball, and beats coming at you. You're running out of room on the baseline. I, and then for and the totally shot to actually go in. Right. And then you but you're to like, not swish it and it still goes in is like impossible. Yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna start ranking shots this <laughs> one. I don't I, I, I just I like could anybody I would love to see a YouTube clip of somebody just trying to make that shot over but and over so again. But it's so different. It's different than like Leitner because the because of the bouncing. It's also different because like the announcers don't even know what to do. Like they're just like they're just quiet. The until whole place it goes dead. It's actually like insane. It's surreal. Yeah. Kawhi has time to crouch like and then a golfer watch. watching a putt. <laughs> He crouches and he's like, oh, it's, you know, it's almost like a, the, a master's a good, putt it, on it the does, 16th It does hole. remind me of a long putt. Yeah. Yeah. And then he's right near the bench. So he immediately gets swarmed. And then you watch uh, Van Vliet for some reason runs out on the court. Like he's like in shock. He does this thing where he, instead of running at Kawhi, he just kind of, he's like a chicken with his head cut off. And yeah. then he comes back in and Gasol is cheering, but then he sees Embiid all sad and he ends up consoling. There's just a lot going on. I watched every angle. I think the Raptors radio broadcast is really good. What's that one like? Just the guy loses his butt. Yeah. But yeah, the, the Philly guy that was surprisingly upbeat. Say around the rim and it's good. Sixers win. <laughs> Raptors, Raptors win. Raptors win. I mean, no, the, the Sixers. I mean, a Raptors win. Oh, yeah. the Raptors guy is, okay. The Sixers guy. Was just like, oh, well. He's like, it's good. Raptors win. <laughs> but you would have been, you would have thought he would have been like, what the fuck? <laughs> oh, no. You got to be fucking kidding me. No. Maybe he had like a beach rental. Not like this. <laughs> He's like, we'll be at the shore next week. Uh, so, and by I the way, real quick though, like the thing that I don't know if you were, but then they go down 2-0 to Milwaukee and everyone right. was like, oh, they're done. They're done. Because yeah. I remember you and I, I mean, they had to come back and win that double overtime game. Like it's, would we be talking about this shot, you know, if they don't win four straight against a Milwaukee team where it felt like it was oh, uh, like, hey, this is over. How's Golden State going to defend Giannis? It's going to be Durant. Yeah, I mean, some of the stuff well, we started doing. Didn't we do the whole— We, we did the pod after that. Being we like, did it when there was like 2 nothing, right? Because I remember we, we were theorizing that the Philly series just took, took too much out of Kawhi and the Raptors in general. Like they it was just too hard of a series. There was a couple of times, I mean, like, they lost that first game to Orlando on the Augustine shot, and everybody was like, Raptors, same old Raptors. Pete DJ Augustine. Uh, I think it actually was Pete He's, I like when a He's guy, an Apex Mountain later. When a guy says, like, you know, you keep sleeping on us, and you're like, okay, but if you say that, <laughs> and then you get worked, yeah. you have to apologize to everybody, be like, hey, you know what? Can we sleep on you now? <laughs> You've been eliminated. You were accurate to sleep. Yeah. So, when you talk about the what if of if they had lost to Milwaukee, the greatest non-final shots of all time. I actually went through this. I put some this energy This is amazing. Thought into I, now this. I feel I'm not prepared anymore. I, no, no, I no. always feel comfortable up until now. I, I, this is, I'm the host. This is part of my job. I think the three greatest non-final shots of all time, I ranked as it had to have actually swung the title and won the team the title eventually. So there's been three. Kawhi, Robert Horry against the 2002 Kings. Because mm -hmm. I think they lose that series. They're down 3-1. Five and seven are in Sacramento. 
And I think Sacramento wins the title. So if he doesn't make that, I think the Lakers lose the title. And then uh, Mara Ely. Yes. 1995, which is a crazy game. The Suns are just better. The Rockets are basically you have 45 and 37 or something that season. Yeah. They get Clyde Drexler. Everybody thinks it's going to be Phoenix's year. It's like the first good clutch Kevin Johnson game. He's like 21 for 21 on free throws in that game. He's got like 40 plus points. He's just torching Houston. Goes to the line down one, 12 seconds left or 20 seconds left, makes the first one and gacks the second one. So now Houston has the ball, tie game. For some reason, Phoenix presses the guards. It's actually a crazy clip. They press the guards coming out of the backcourt and then they swing it around and Ely's just in the corner, Ellie. Yeah, and, he's uh, known as Ellie back then. Yeah, right? sorry, I'm calling him Ely for some reason. Mara <laughs> Ellie's in the corner. He's just wide open. And it's like, you should throw the Kikim. Oh, no, you should actually take that. Yeah. And he makes it and they win. And that swung the title. They end up beating uh, Orlando. Did you have round. any that weren't title swingers? Yeah. I think the best one, this is another one. So, like, L- so LJ's four pointer, Derek Fisher's 0.4 seconds left. That's what, 03? The Spurs won? Uh, yeah, that's 0-4. O- no, no, 0-4, yeah, because they won in 0-3. And you right. could argue maybe the Spurs would have done better against Detroit than that Lakers team did. Allen Houston against Miami in 1999, MJ against the 89 Cavs, Dame against Russ in OKC. Barkley ended the 93 um, yeah. Spurs series to get in there. Yeah. Same thing for Stockton four years later against Houston. The one that's been, two have been lost in history. DJ making the layup and the bird steals the ball game, mm-hmm. which in person watching that, it seemed like he missed it. And if you watch it, like, I don't kind of know how it went in because he's it's flinging it. He's angle, doing this yeah. way. Somebody's coming in to block it and he flings it this way and it hits the right side of the rim and somehow rolls back in. But he easily could have missed that, which would have been the worst moment of my life. And then um, <laughs> <laughs> the one that's lost completely which was an amazing, I remember where I watched it one, was when Samson knocked out the 86 Lakers. Yeah, the inbound. That's the best buzzer beater. That's yeah. like the most underrated buzzer beater of yeah, all the buzzer never beaters. never talked about. One second left. They've, they've lost the first game. They've won the next three. They have a chance to close out the Lakers. I think they're down one or it's tied. Inbounds pass, and he catches it, just kind of flings it, and then Cooper sinks under the basket like he's been assassinated. Lost in history. Yeah, that one um, is funny because one of my favorite Bob Ryan bits is that he counts that one as a Lakers loss <laughs> against the Celtics. In oh, the I, NBA I Finals. fully support it. <laughs> they didn't show up. We were there. Where were you? <laughs> he just would write. And then he's like, I know the numbers are off, but I count the 86 finals loss. That, that goes on LA's record, not Houston's. <laughs> I agree. I, I, yeah, I figured you would. But the Pretty thing good. is, if you're doing that, then we have to count 88 too. So they the still have the edge. deal. Yeah. Because the Pistons beat us, and we should have showed up for that one. Um, I would also say most fun buzzer beater ever. Just the experience of the ball this bouncing one? around. Yeah, I disagree. Him, well, not for if you're <laughs> yeah. a Philly fan, but just <laughs> yeah. the actual shot had I the disagree. most things. <laughs> right. The actual shot had the most things going on until somebody makes a half court shot to win a series or something. I would say this is the best we're going to do. The Lillard one was That's what I was just going to say. Nuts. The thing that, is, and I when know you think it's recency it, though, bias and no, the, the magnitude. No, no stakes, The fucking though. move where he does the time and he just goes rock a I know, come but on. then they get swept in the Western Finals. <laughs> like, come on. Yeah, but I just mean like in terms of theater, I think Lillard had like a little bit more And the thing it. that was funny about the Lillard thing is it still wasn't a great shot. <laughs> and then Paul George said it. Yeah. And they were like, oh, cool. Paul George is here. Tell us <laughs> after another disappointing. Paul George is logged on right. to cleaning the glass. <laughs> The fun one with that is that it basically ended the Russ era. Yeah, that was fun. That was it. Sure. Um, well, just think about it, though, because like Lillard forever has been behind Russ, and then I think it felt like finally, like, wait a minute, why do we keep putting Westbrook ahead yeah, of Lillard? What are we doing? Like, let's stop doing that. And I, I feel like that was kind of generally accepted in the NBA world. And then for him to do that to him, that was... But yeah, you're right. I mean, it's not like he won, <laughs> did anything afterwards. They got smoked by Golden State. Kevin Harlan's call... This is the rare time where we had the right announcer at the right game. It's basically him or Gus Johnson I want in this moment, and Gus Johnson isn't allowed to do NBA. Um, His call is, Oh! Game! Series! Toronto has won! (laughs) It's really good. It's really like everything you'd want from those. I didn't do it as well as That's one that you can't really practice either. No. Yeah. He actually sounds like he's having an orgasm. 
Like Kevin Harlan having the greatest orgasm of his life is exactly the same as the O he lets out in this. And let's hope we never find out. Yeah, I could see that. Um, Kawhi was 7-18 in the first half and 9 for 21 the rest of the way. Here were the baskets. Pull up in traffic, driving layup in traffic, three-pointer open, pull up, pull up, pull up, a runner bouncing off someone, three-point play, long two, and then the game winning three. DeRozan-esque. No easy hoops, just period. It's, it's, really, it's really great. Here's another one that's great. Fred Van Vliet's incredible playoffs game log. This is crazy. I couldn't believe this. So he's 0 for 5 in this game in 15 yeah. minutes. Yeah. Game one of Orlando, first game in the playoffs. He's 5 for 9, makes three threes, 14 points. His next 14 playoff games, he plays 20 minutes a game, 3.3 points a game, 21.7% field goal percentage, 5 for 42 from 3. Then his last nine games, 32 minutes a game, 15 points a game, 51% shooting, 45 for 88 from three, 52.6%. It's honestly like he was replaced by a different <laughs> At human the end, being. I mean, it is, I mean, it's still so soon, but, or so recent, but he didn't, he didn't feel like it didn't miss mm -hmm. for about a week. It was beyond the just, heat check. You're like, what is going on? He's actually like on, just on fire. But I think if they have the Van Vliet from those 14 games in the Golden State Series, even with the injuries, I think they might lose. No, but they like really Lowry, needed him in those games. I'm not a big Lowry guy, but but Lowry put some games together. You know what I mean? But he wasn't, this wasn't, this wasn't one of them. Are you not available to give Lowry's, um, the speech introducing him at the Basketball Hall of Fame in 10 years? Because that's happening. <laughs> no, he's He's, he's making the Hall of Fame. He's in. Kyle Lowry? Kyle Lowry will be in the Hall of Fame. Okay. I'm not saying I agree with that. I'm just telling you it's going to happen. Oh, I don't, I, I just assume, As amazing yeah. as this sounds, I think Serge Ibaka might be Yeah, I was going to ask who in this game do you think is in the Hall of Mark Fame? Mark Gasol? Definitely. How, Mark, okay. How is Ibaka in the Hall of Fame? Because the whole international thing. They factor that is, in. Dino Rajo's in. Yeah, I get that all sorts of people get in, but I mean, if you're not actually playing internationally most of the time, right? Danny Green doesn't go to the I've Hall of Fame. I've stopped trying to figure this out. I don't think You're so. asking if Danny Green goes to the Hall of Fame? I'm just, I'm, I don't know. He's got a couple of rings. Mitch Richmond's in. I, <laughs> <laughs> Danny um, Green's not going to the Hall of Fame. Like, oh, he had uh, two intramural championships. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think Robert Horry should be in the Hall of Fame? I don't. I would actually vote for him. I know you would. We've talked about this. He's just, swung just, multiple finals. That's all that matters. I judge my players by titles. Marc Gasol mentioned him ceasing the celebration of hug Embiid. It was an emotional moment. And then another one stage the best was how much Embiid was affected by this loss and yeah. how genuine it was. It really made me like him more. And I hope he transferred in. What, what's the word on him being in shape this year? Oh, 20 pounds. 20 pounds no, without doing anything. Yeah, there was nothing that he did that was any different. Lost 20? He's lost focused. 20. He just said he's, he's focused on his job at Stopped hand. Stopped eating candy? Doesn't say. Says he's nothing, not doing anything different. Which, I mean, you know, I don't know how that works. I don't know if he's going Cato, Paleo. No, that's what's so weird. He said he hasn't done anything different yeah. and he's just down 20 pounds. I realized like five minutes ago, Chris is pretty traumatized right now. No, I'm okay. I, this is, you this like has been okay? About, this has been about what I expected. He was, he was definitely more fun during the town. <laughs> <laughs> well, talk about Shine just to cheer up for like two minutes. What do you think Shine's doing now? Everybody just tags her now. And they're like, <laughs> hey, yeah, down. no, they're just, hey, Rosillo, did you see, did you see her? And I'm, you know, I'm uncomfortable about it now. Are I, I love it. I love it. I think it's great. Do you have any other what's age the best or should we move on? Um, I think the Ibaka saving them will be something, you know, people forget about it nationally, but locally you'll always remember like Abaka be this revered person in Toronto for, for what he did. It's so funny how most title seasons have at least one guy like that, that either had a game like that or a series like that. You think like even 10 years ago, Oh nine, the Lakers, Ariza just is awesome in that series. Yeah. They become know? like local legends forever yeah. because of that. And that's it. You need, like in 2008, the, my last Celtics title posing house, my last, my last Celtics <laughs> title 11 years ago, <laughs> posing house. P.J. Brown against the Cavs. Right. Some big hoops. P.J. Like Brown. You always it. remember those yeah. random fucking dudes that come through. It was one of the problems with Philly. They didn't have the guys. What stage is the worst? Lowry, Green, and Van Vliet were 5 for 21 in this game. <laughs> 1 for 10 from 3. Embiid. Uh, I think it's Simmons. I, I have him coming. Embiid was 6 for 18. 1 for 6 from 3. What stage is the worst for me with him is just... 
if if you gave me one, if I if it's like, how can Philly win this game? Give me one do over. What would you do? I would just have pounded the ball to be down low. Just like you know so what, that's the, let's the, get twenty free throws in this game. The, this, this is guy. the central question: is like whether or not that is Embiid's preference to not take the beating down there and do the like. But, no, but it's game making. seven, though. I understand. Like they, there's there was it was actually like almost like I felt like I was on mushrooms watching Embiid being the point guard and Simmons being power forward in this game. It just it's like it's a miracle it got to game seven if that's how they were playing. Do you, know you think I mean? like Marcus saws in the locker room after game seven? They're like, hey Mark, why do you think they didn't post up Embiid? And he's just like, I don't know, man, but I'm glad they did it that way. <laughs> you know, it was cool when he was 25 feet from the basket. He's seven foot three. Because there's one moment in this game in the second half where he goes baseline against two people. Destroys them. And just easily, easily, easily gets a dunk. And you're just going, oh, well, that, you should probably do that more often. And the thing is, man, we always know with Embiid how tired he looks at these games. But this was, you know, when we were trying to do like, hey, what coaching thing do you wish... You know, this is only their second game in five days. They played those main five guys 40-something minutes. You know, Toronto was able to stagger their guard thing a little bit more because mm. they just had more bodies that could actually take shots. And Philly basically just played those five guys. Um, and you go, oh, you know, could they have done more with Embiid? But you're right. I mean, game seven, like, hey, this, is, this works better. And then you can run stuff off of it. Do you the know, thing the other team doesn't want you to do. It's right. always a good role and in Kawhi, basketball. You know, Kawhi was really good in this game, too, when there were doubles that he didn't want to attack. He was really good at swinging the ball and getting it out of there, and Embiid's really good at that, too. He's, he, yeah. was, he has his so, moments in this in this game, but like a lot of the stuff, especially the stuff at the beginning of quarters where it just feels like the go-to offense is him at the top of the key. It's oof. just... It's, it's just, the same thing, and everybody figured it out, and you know, a credit to Doris Burke for finally somebody else said it, because I'd be like, why would anyone go for this stupid pump. fucking pump fake? Yeah. Don't go for it. Don't it's it's stu- and he's not even hitting the shots now as much as he used yeah, to. Yeah, his legs are tired. And so, you know, Dora said it on a broadcast, and she's like, you know, I would have a rule where everybody just has to stay home. And I think people finally have figured it Gasol out. Gasol did. Gasol doesn't move. So Simmons, he's basically how the Pistons use Ben Wallace in mm-hmm. the second half of this game, where it's like, hey, dude, we need you for all these other things, but. You know, when we're trying to score, can you just kind of figure out a place to go where you're not really too involved? So he kind of would wander on the opposite side of wherever the ball was and linger like near the paint so he could come in and get offensive rebounds, I guess. He gets some backdoor passes from guys. Yeah. It's pretty brutal. So where are you guys at with the two of them? I mean, I mean I, is it a lot of wait and see to see if like... The- I just don't think you need both of them. I, I wish Simmons had his own team where this things very, could run for like obsessed with this. He's like, they're wasting Ben Simmons by having him like this. And you I- could feel it in this game a couple of times when Embiid wasn't out there. And it's kind of like Simmons. Like the, he, the shine, like there was a couple possessions with him. You go, all right, this was awesome. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Let's do this more. I mean, because he really is, he's pretty impossible to deal with once he's in transition. Yeah, if he's downhill, and, it's over. And if you can't like figure out a couple times in the half court to get him where he is going downhill. I um, like him on the block on the right side when he can spin into the lane lefty or he can do the pass because when he's down there then he can do that swing pass all the way to the other corner he can find the two shooters on these two things you basically can't double him and I, I'm just confused why they wouldn't that should be a focal point I don't know if they worked on that this year but I don't love the two of them together but you think like they almost beat Toronto who won the title with the two of them together it's flawed it's a little like, it does remind me of Samson Olajuwon a little bit, where it's like these two things, they're both talented. They don't totally make sense, but you can't argue with the results, I guess. And in this case, they almost beat Toronto. Philly's bench in this game. Um, TJ McConnell, DMP. How do you feel about that four months later? I mean, I, that was a, a long, longer conversation about the lack of backward depth that they had going into the, to the playoffs. How would you feel about what they got from the Markel Fultz trade in this game? They didn't get anything from Mark Elfold straight in this game. Yeah. Yeah. Zero. Um, how'd you feel about Shamit being thrown into the Harris trade? Fuck off. <laughs> I wasn't asking Matt. I'm not getting mad. Does Shamit play in this game? Uh, no. You don't think so? No. Sham- does, does Shamit play? Hell yes. yes. Yeah, he does. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So they 27 minutes total from the bench, eight points minus 29 combined. I have another what's age worst, then beads three point ball fakes. Um, which we talked about earlier. Any other what's age the worst for you? Mm, 
I went into it trying to find more things I would have a problem with coaching wise. And I, I didn't really find anything new. You know, it just reminded me of like all those nights when I watch the Sixers and I get really frustrated. So has, like, yeah. has, can we say what's aged the worst is officially the shot of 10,000 people standing outside watching a giant <laughs> You're video You're done with Jurassic Park? I think I'm good. Yeah? I think I'm good. It's like, hey, here's some guys. Oh, they're jumping up and down. Yeah, but it's Toronto. New city. Okay, but they won a title. Do we have to deal with that anymore or no? I think the whole Toronto thing good? is just like, this guy showed up, got traded to somewhere he didn't want to go. All year, we kind of thought he wasn't staying. He hits that shot. They win a title. And like, I don't know if it's Canada or if it's Kauai or what, but everybody's like, cool. <laughs> like, that's it. Like, do you know how badly this would have gone in, a, in an American city? Like certain American cities? Like, yes, thanks for the ring and everything, but it's just this collective like, yeah, that was fun. Yeah. Now it's over. Well, I had, ironically, I have this in the next category. Greatest what if sliding doors moment. And the first one is, let's say Philly wins this game. How do we remember that Kawhi trade? Because uh, Masai, that's now hailed as one of the five smartest, savviest, forward-thinking trades we've had in the last 25, 30 years. I still would think it's terrific because, you know, sometimes we're quick to react when it's five years of playoff bounces with DeRozan and Lowry. Like, I think that's enough of a track record to go, hey, I think this same thing that sucks happens every year with these mm -hmm. guys. So why don't we just break this up? So what did you really do? You you broke up having to give DeRozan a huge contract. So even if the shot doesn't go in, they lose in the second round. I thought it was just a bold trade by a GM who needed it. Like, not every trade for me is equal. Like, what's going on? What's your team story been the last few years? Okay, Toronto, I get it. Like, you need to hit the reset on this a little bit. And I respected them for doing it. And they've and, been pretty good about getting that out into the public. Like, there is, like, th that that sort of narrative about, like, well, you know, Masai actually wanted to blow it up. He wanted to do a rebuild. So this is actually just, like, a, a cool little, like, detour until he does do that. I feel like I would feel exactly the same about this trade either way. I think Masai's little legacy, he get, he takes a much better positive hit for it. But ultimately, it was a really good trade. Do you it think put that, them in, in, it gave them the chance to win the title and put them in a situation where if a couple things went right, they could actually win it. And they get to rebuild and reboot anyway, which I think is what he wanted to do. So I thought it was brilliant before it happened. Now I think it's an iconic trade. Do you think that if Until it, we find out what happens with Pearl. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Next NBA support group video. <laughs> What do you think Pirtle. happens if he misses this shot? Do you think he stays in Toronto? No. Stays gone. in the second round? You gone. think he leaves it either way? Not like I have unfinished business. I think gone. he was gone nine months ago. Dear basketball. I think I think he was gone, and I think we're going to have new tampering rules. <laughs> I think he was gone, but I also think if Toronto could have pulled off the Paul George thing. Oh, like yeah. Kawhi was telling dudes in Toronto, hey, you got to get Paul George, and I'll stay. So I don't, I don't know... This is so always, weird this, when they become so enamored with another basketball player. And it's always somebody they've never played with before. Yeah. I, I just, it's like dating, man. They're like, oh my God, I'd love it. And then like a month later, you're like, okay, so this is why this person's single. This is what the funniest thing about the Kyrie <laughs> KD thing. I saw some video the other day. They're at like Dave right. and Buster's doing Papa Shot. And I was like, this is so cute. Yeah. This is a relationship where they're definitely going to break up in a year and a half. But right now they're in the honeymoon stage. It's like, oh man, so glad I found you. Yeah. Let's the, see how that goes. The best are, I still think, I still think Jarrett Jack, like his acquisition <laughs> in New Orleans, be like, all right, we're going to sit, we'll, we'll calm this Chris Paul thing down. Yeah, that's right. What if the ringer never does the Colangelo piece? Well, Brett Brown's probably not the coach. They handle the summer way differently. Yeah. yeah. Way differently. And you could argue that they're, the roster's probably in better shape. So they are, I think the 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 rumor was it was going to be Jay Wright. The, 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 that so season. we think the coach is different if Colangelo stays. Yeah, I do. Do we think they give up on faults earlier than they gave up on him and maybe actually get something that could have helped them last year? Uh, not necessarily because I think Fultz was a Colangelo pick. Okay, so he's got so he's got Fultz. a lot riding on Fultz working out. The Harris deal. I don't know if he makes that, but. I think the fact the that Butler they didn't deal, I don't, I don't know, is the one I don't know about. They didn't have a GM. They were in this incredible asset situation and had no GM heading into the draft and free agency. And if you go back and look at all the moves they made, they did not make the team better. So. 
Nerd Corner. Really to dig deep for this one. 13 players won a non-overtime playoff game in which they scored 40-plus points and took 39-plus shots. Wilt did it three times. Iverson did it twice. Baylor did it twice. Wilt, MJ, Jerry West, Rick Barry, Bob McAdoo, Russell Westbrook, and Kawhi. It's a pretty good list. It's a great list. That's like there's no stinkers in that one. Uh, but Kawhi's 41 points, the least ever of anyone who took 39 shots and only scored 41 points, but yet it still felt like a weirdly effective game. But Coming is, up next! This is, why I hate advanced, <laughs> this is why I hate advanced metrics. So you look at this advanced metrics, so they should be like, oh man, 39 shots to play 41 points. This is where advanced metrics go wrong. No, this is, and this is one of those really classic things where you go, no, your eyes were lying to you the whole time. You know, years removed, look at this box score, and he struggled, and I'll, I will... I will never give in to that ever. I liked watching, every shot he took. Right. Watching again today, you just go, this is, this is a, it's not just this dominant force. And he, you know, we've been over it all, but his control, like he was out of the 10 people that were out there, he was, he was easily the most comfortable, easily the most in control. And a box score, unfortunately, doesn't do it justice. I would, I would so, highly recommend that anybody can watch like his clips or, you know, the, the full game on YouTube or whatever. He does things like when he's just in possession where he's going, um, he's, his directional stuff where he's going towards the basket and away from it, but so much of it is him dribbling the basketball almost behind him. Like he's he's facing the hoop, but he's got the ball essentially like on a string behind him. And you're, I'm like, I don't think I've ever actually ever seen anyone do this. Like be double, triple covered, fan guys off with the left side of his body while dribbling behind him with the right side of his body and then pick the perfect time to go and get contact and do a layup. It, He's got to be so unbelievably strong. I think a lot of these guys are crazy strong. Like I think LeBron is so much stronger than anybody realizes. But the to be able to dribble and have people be like, there's no way I can get the ball because if I hit this guy, I'm just going to bounce mm -hmm. backwards. I uh. It's I, like how Rosillo is kind of that kind of strong. <laughs> I I was reaching for a water once. I bumped into him and flying backwards. <laughs> like like loudly like, like in the deck. Obviously. And one. Uh yeah. I there's no doubt. There's no doubt. Because you know what I'll look for? I'll look for like when guys go to put put it up on the rim or whatever, and you'll notice this. And like another guy will like get the ball and then they still finish. Yeah. It's like I blocked your shot and I'm six eight, two forty, and the ball didn't move. Like the ball still winning. That's basically LeBron and Kawhi. LeBron. Yeah. I think Giannis will be there about three years from now. My Giannis muscle, is just a, muscle strength yeah. wise. I think twenty nine year old Giannis is might be the biggest physical freak we've probably had. Yeah, Pro, maybe prepared like for anything with Ojale probably as well. <laughs> Ojale number two. Dion Waiters Award best head heat check. We mentioned Ibaka, 17 and 8, 3 for 3 for 3. It's looked like 2014. Okay, see Ibaka. His first six games of this series, he averaged 7 and 4, 39% shooting, zero threes. Cooks. So this was legitimately a heat check because it came out of nowhere so wasn't compared there, to where the previous six games were. The Sixers were up. Like the Sixers had one game in Philly during like a morning. I think it must have been game four. And it looked like they had completely solved the Raptors. And then game five was one of those weird, like, Embiid sick, he may or may not play games. That, fl that flung and changed that's, the series. And that swung it. And yeah. then, yeah. No, that's a good uh, reminder of what the series was. Because we're like, what the hell's going on with him? He's got gas. Remember? And you're like, what's, was, it, what's going it, it, on? It's never it, been explained. It's never been, it's like, is it? That would be a good podcast for us. And it was also it's like, never been explained. The new NBA podcast. Sorry, right, we're going to talk about LeBron in 2010, those last two Celtic games. Hi. It's never been explained. I'm Sarah Koenig. <laughs> <laughs> that sound you hear is Joel Embiid. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> Big picture take. Usually this is, we wish we had thought of this in the moment, but the moment was four months ago. I'm going to throw this out there. What if this is the highlight of the Embiid Simmons era? Oh my Almost God. Almost winning this game. That's horrifying. No, what if... <laughs> so no. Hold on, we need a, we need a break not, for Chris. It's actually, you know what? I'm almost, <clears throat> I would say I'm 85% confident that will not be the case. Okay. Yeah. There's 15% it might be the case. Well, you know. There is a world in which we look back and be like, man, and when those guys almost beat Kawhi, you know, the same way we look at the 86 Rockets who combusted for different reasons, but- I think the Eastern the Conference Lakers broke was like right the for, them for them to be better. 
to, to have a, a, a path. So it's like if 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 Kawhi had stayed in the Eastern Conference, if 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 a couple of free agency things had broken the wrong way and the Eastern Conference got a lot more crowded, Durant being hurt, like I think that they have a pretty good shot at going to the conference finals this year. I, I think this will not be the highlight. I just wanted to mention it. There's a there's a small chance that this might have been think? the peak. Well, one of the things I kept saying throughout the playoffs, you know, last year and trying to figure that out is everything was still new. It was Kawhi's first year with this crew, so we didn't really know what to expect there. We didn't know what to expect with Philly with two new pieces. The Giannis thing still is new because he took it to this level. And then I never believed in the Celtics the whole time, but that was a newer version of itself. So you had four of these teams at the top of the East where you could see it kind of break anywhere. So then you think this year, okay, what's established? Is, Is Milwaukee established? It's the same team. I think they're good. I don't think they should scare the hell out of anybody other than, you know, one guy. They're definitely a little bit worse unless Giannis jumps 15%. But roster-wise, I, I think they're a little bit worse. Because I, I agree about it. I don't know how the hell he's jump. The Brogdon thing's a real... But he was only, like, like in and out during the regular season. He anyway. was their safety blanket in case Bledsoe shit the bed for two straight weeks, <laughs> he which he did in the playoffs. Bledsoe, though, so. But he was terrible. <laughs> So, wait a minute. So then if we have Boston, who, you know, I think will be competitive at times, but not ahead of Philly. No, this should be Philly's conference. It should. And because Toronto now takes their step back, and we have to wait on Brooklyn. And even though the Pacers are like going into this. Oladipo not starting this season maybe for a couple months is helpful, too, for them. Yeah, and it's, like it's how, all lined up for the heats. The Heat aren't going to be that serious. The Tim McCarver Memorial Broadcast Team Complaint Corner. I left empty. I actually enjoyed the uh, announcers. Pretty good. Uh, at one so, point, Roz I think was involved. Gre- Greg An- Greg Anthony called Fred Van Vliet a speed merchant, which I, I don't think is technically true. It was but ambitious. In the moment, you know, it was ambitious. <laughs> they they, they didn't bother we, me though. Is there an I alternative? His, uh, what's what's speed? If it's speed merchant, could we be missing a definition? What does that even mean? L- oh, like Jesse like, Pinkman? Like he kind of thing, spells, <laughs> He sells <laughs> his own speed. <laughs> does that mean that he's just he's a purveyor of quickness? Maybe that's what he should that's say. That's probably it. Speed purveyor. Yeah. Right. Mm. Um, I like the broadcast. It was really I like the broadcast. Yeah. Apex Mountain, Kawhi, this whole six-week yeah. stretch, yes. We can make a case for Ibaka. I bet you if you go through those those game logs of the, the finals, or unless... He had know. a couple of good games to go on state, but I'm saying, like, they needed him the most in this game. He ended up winning the title. So, maybe. And then uh, Toronto fans, this whole stretch. But I don't, I don't think this specific game was Apex Mountain. Maybe Kevin Harlan is on here. Hmm. Best call he's Greg had. Greg Anthony, Apex Mountain? How about Nick really Nurse, Hot Girl Summer? Because he really started like feeling himself. <laughs> you know, he kind of went from like, oh, this guy's funny. Was there and a drink like, moment in this game? Uh, if there was, we couldn't find it on the clips. We didn't have it on on these. But he had, he had calmed it down a little bit. But yeah, Nurse was like... Yeah, I'm going for it. Sam Ash Nurse just yeah, coming out. Nurse is just out there with a couple of white claws going, <laughs> this is amazing. White claws. Hottest retroactive take just when you wish you had in the moment. Phoebe Waller-Bridge memes. Just being like, it me. <laughs> Phoebe Waller-Bridge. <laughs> Season three, question mark. <laughs> uh, my hottest retroactive take is, are we sure Philly would have beaten Milwaukee? No. No. Because Milwaukee did really well against them. Yeah. I think mentally I was just like, man, if Philly wins this game, maybe they win the title. But I actually think Milwaukee would have beaten Philly. I honestly had forgotten that Milwaukee went up 2 nothing on Toronto. Like th- yeah. that, that, is, that is just one of those funny things where you're just like, you blank out on that, that kind of stuff. Any hottest retroactive take you wish you had other than Brett Brown? Uh, maybe needed an offensive conciliary? Um, I feel like I've been over this, this Sixer thing, but I'm not saying that like, I have the solution for it. Um, no, I don't, I don't have a retroactive, Hey, I wish I had said this. Cause it was only a few months ago. And I think I I'm very like comfortable. Yeah. yeah I'm comfortable I don't have like a hot take. I That's think that I there are too. a couple of guys on the Raptors who are lucky that shot went in. Best unintentional comedy moment. I'm going with, uh, the joy on Kawhi's face after he made the, the shot and how him celebrating and reacting was just high comedy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it's like he had never celebrated anything before. I really enjoyed that. He, uh, he's, he's something different, man. He, uh, I, the only other unintentional comedy thing I had was MB does a, an absolutely criminal flop on a, on a three point shot that he takes where Gasol like is standing yeah. next to him and MB goes down. It's just full Real Madrid mid- midfielder d- diving. He's like grabbing his face and like his, and his shoulder at the same time. And Gasol's just like standing over him. Like, what the fuck are you doing? I don't have any unanswerable <laughs> questions. Cause I think we covered all this stuff and I think we know who won the game. It was Kawhi Leonard. That's the the only thing I would want to know is if like how how much the guys in Toronto 
you know, because all year, hey, we want to make them comfortable. We want to load management. I mean, they they kissed his ass all year long to give themselves any hope of keeping him around. And there's nothing you can knock because it all worked. It all worked. But I wondered if they'd ever have a moment of, you know, moment of honesty five years removed from that where they'd be like, yeah, we, like this happened, this happened, this happened, and we just knew, you know. And so, like, in a way, if you have this thing that's kind of hanging over the franchise that this guy's going to bounce no matter what you do to accommodate him, you know, a lot of times I can just – derail a team 99 times out of 100 probably yeah. right like i can't think of another example where it's like yeah this has got a lot of caveats to it there's probably it's probably got a shelf life we don't really know it was it was almost more like a mid-season baseball trade where they bring in a a, a third starter to win the in the playoffs or right. something uh the way it with the way that they handle it the whole year but in, in a lot of ways it's probably going to be more like the model going forward chris ryan what's the one thing you would have done differently I think I would have had like more of the offense running through Butler earlier in the game. I think that there's a chance that they win this game by like eight or nine if 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 there's like a little bit more of offensive fluidity early in the game and and Butler was just pretty much absent until the fourth quarter. I would have pounded it to Embiid, tried to get Gasol in foul trouble. Would have brought in Mike Scott to take out Kawhi, <laughs> Zaza style. Yeah, just, just step under him. Hey. Hey, dude, I'm sorry. You're still going to get a max deal. Uh, who who in this game was the most like gem from the town? <laughs> Oof. Uh, Van Vliet's haircut, maybe. Um, but I think gem would show up in a game seven. I think Kyle Lowry was a little gemish. There's some you think you're better than me in him. Yeah, in this game. I mean, Lowry complains about He wasn't making every... shots, but he was, he was definitely all over the place. I didn't. I didn't feel bad about my complaints about Lowry's complaining because it's it's unbelievable. When do you think they're going to start doing the whole? You know, people think just because Kawhi's gone, we're not the champs. Oh, I think Everyone's they're already, already chirping a little bit. I'm excited about us. for that. Yeah, nobody believes in us. Oh yeah, yeah. we're being disrespected. We, we, you have the to road to the next title goes still goes through here. We're the champs. Yeah. Yeah, I always feel bad for teams when they say stuff like that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> the odds are they're going to sell this team off for parts over the next six months would be my guess. Yeah, I would imagine of expiring Lowry's contracts somewhere else. You would think. Yeah. You would think. Uh, this was a pleasure. The Sports Rewatchables. Thanks, Chris, Bill. you did it. Thanks, I, I thought. I, th I feel it, like you've it, been medicated, though. Me? Yeah, I think you took something. <laughs> <laughs> a little CBD? No. No, I think, yeah, you did something. No, I'm You're fine. You're very mellow. You're more mellow than I expected. It's just not a funny game. You know what I mean? Like it was like there's like there's not enough characters and there wasn't enough drama. It was like there's like a really huge crazy shot that happens at the end, but it's basically two guys having a rock fight. But I I you know I love doing the podcast with you guys. <laughs> Can we do one next time? That's an older game. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs>